So it was a great time in my life because I had my own studio and uh, I just walked to work, you know, right down the street. And uh, these, these drawings, these first series of drawings came about during that time at the Guadalupe Annex. And uh, I was really fortunate to get that grant in that studio because uh, I first, I, I sold a couple of my first drawings in that place, you know. I met my first art collector. I met uh, um, um, Kathy Vargas and, and uh, mm -hmm. Miguel Cortinas mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was already kind of introduced to the, uh, the uh, arts uh, administration and arts uh, uh, organizations here. And tell us, why, you were already uh, working in a kind of psychedelic style. Why was that? Why did you sort of just start right out with really intense color neon and agitated colors, line? Neon colors, definitely. I, I bought a whole set of neon gouache uh, and neon color pencils, the Prismacolor neons and, and neon acrylic, you know. So I just love that warm color, you know. And with my technique, it was easier to uh, uh, work in layers, you know, and let that neon kind of show through. Almost like a black light painting that I, I, mm -hmm. I remember kind of growing up with, you know, all these rock and roll posters and black light. So uh, you were really art. into the rock and roll culture and that more Definitely. or less affected yeah. Yeah. your aesthetic and, sensibility. And, and uh, working with different materials, I think that's what happened. I was really experimenting with a lot more, uh, like I said, uh, gouaches and neon based paints and mm -hmm. stuff, you know. So it's very experimental time for me. Uh, this is uh, 1994, uh, Por Tu Culpa. It's uh, mixed media on paper, 30 by 40 inches. And uh, here tell I am tell again. Tell us about the subject. Doing, doing a lot of research at bars, you know. <laughs> uh, and and there's, there, I, I was looking back and I was like, man, most of my early work are just bar art, you know, as bar paintings. But uh, these were fun times, you know. I, I used to hang out with... Miguel uh, Cortinas, we'd go to the Esquire. This is actually drawn, uh, uh, sketched out at the Esquire. And uh, it's based on a story that I, I, I uh, uh, happened across on Thursday night. Were uh, people actually posing for you or were you no, just sort of? No, this was real life. They were, yeah. they were, they, they didn't need to pose. They they, were I mean, they didn't very know you were drawing them. On their the own, they didn't know. know you were drawing them. They did not know. No, I okay. know. Uh, you know, so. It's uh, like taking a candid photograph, but you're doing it with your, with yeah, your sketchbook. Yeah. So I think, I think I, I just had fun with these drawings. I was very uh, caricature like, very uh, whimsical. I, I, uh, uh, a lot of my early work was, was well, that way. Were you familiar with any of the artists such as Peter Saul at that point, or did you develop this independent of that? Actually, I, I, um, I was not very familiar with uh, a lot of artists. I had to research uh, a lot of mural work, you know, so I mm -hmm. didn't know a lot of those artists, but uh, not until a little later did I really start looking at Peter Saul or looking at, uh, um, um, you know, even... Uh, I had grown up with Crumb and, and the yes. fabulous furry Freak Brother car comic books and stuff yes. like that. So I was introduced to that kind of caricature-like so style. So the caricature, at least as little prototype there in, in that. It was, it was yeah. a nice little influence, definitely. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Luis Jimenez uh, yes. later on in life, you know, that, that I was able to meet him. And uh, it, it was like an art star to me. I was like, wow, you know, I really admire this man and his art, you know, so I was really happy that I got to meet a lot of these artists, you know. Tell us about these two works. I think they're a couple of years apart, but they're very similar. They're, uh, they're uh, serigraphs on paper. They're silk screens. Uh, this is uh, 1994 through 1997. I was and, doing and a where, series where, of serigraphs. Yeah, where, where, where did you get into printmaking? How did you start doing prints? I was invited uh, by San Coronado in Austin, and he's still there. He does a project called Serie Project, and mm -hmm. uh, he invites artists from across Texas uh, and all over, actually, nationally and regionally, but mostly regionally. And, and uh, he uh, uh, kind of walked me through. He trained me on, you know, working in that uh, uh, silkscreen media, which I found fascinating, and it was very easy. Back then, we were doing it really old school, was actually inking in every color on a piece of mylar, you know, and I spent a residency there. I actually spent a month there on the first piece, uh, El Spider, and um, uh, learned uh, as much who, who, as I who could. Who is El Spider? El Spider is actually a real person, yeah. you know, uh, this really good friend of mine uh, in the neighborhood, in the Mirasoles, and um, he had a 
tattoo of a, a spider on his neck, like a spider wow. here, and it went all the way down his arm onto his, uh, onto his, his uh, forearm. And there was a web right here in the middle of his forearm. And uh, he was a heroin addict, and t uh, the Tecatos, we used to call them back then, used to get this, this tattoo to cover up their track marks, mm. you know? So, uh, they, but it was really strange. They were very superstitious. They said, well, you're caught in that web of this drug, you know, you're a Tecato, you know? So his nickname became a spider, you know? Mm. And um, he was very superstitious. That's why I depicted him with a broken cigarette. Actually, the cigarette uh, to him one day, uh, he pulled out his last cigarette out of his pack and he goes, oh, that's it. You know, I'm going back in, you know, they're going to bust me. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, it's my last cigarette and it's broken. It's bad luck. It's bad luck, you know. Uh, and it, it's strange how superstitious these guys were. Like when I was in the jail program, none of them would sign the murals. And I'm like, guys, you got to sign these murals. You know, you have to let people know that, you know, uh, you're part of this project. They're like, no way. You don't sign your name in a prison or a jail because mm. that means you're going to come back come back and mm. see it again, you know. <laughs> so it's very strange superstition. So, you know, I started getting into that, you know, superstition because my mom and my aunt, you know, they always told, I grew up with these really strange stories of, you know, uh, uh, you know, bad luck, el, el malo, or, you know, uh, la lechuza, or, you know, el diablito. And so yeah, who, that's who is el diablito? the second piece yeah. is el diablito. And he represents those, you know, bad luck icons, you know, uh, that mala vida, that bad life. He has a, a, a cap on with like buttons of drugs and violence and images of, of uh, uh, all kinds of like these, these evil influences that, you know, they say comes from El Diablito, you know. So this is a, a second silk screen. It's 1997, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was also featured in the, uh, the psychedelic show yes. here mm -hmm. at SAMA. I was very, very happy with that. It also traveled uh, with Sam's collection to uh, uh, Slovakia. Uh, Bratislava, Slovakia. So that went over really well. Both of these pieces went to that gallery just mm. recently. Okay, drive-by shooting. There's a story that goes. That's a big one. one. Yeah, that's a big one. A lot of people uh, probably don't know about this. So no, now's no. your chance to share. Uh, a lot, a lot do because I'm always telling true really? stories. Mm. You know, yeah. I'm like this well, is a true story. This is a true story. Tell. It's a true, based on a true story, you know, but, uh, um, you know, I love telling this story because it, it's, if things would have worked out differently, I wouldn't be sitting here today, you know. That's right. I, I, uh, um, it's very serious, but uh, I think uh, I, I approached it with um, almost a, a way of trying to deal with the situation of a violent drive-by uh, through my art, you know. Uh, in but 1987, uh, I was there in the Mirasol courts, and my mom, I told my mom, I'm like, hey, there's this great party at the Vida Mendes. You know, everybody's going to be there. All my friends are there. I was only uh, about 18. I had actually just turned 18. And my mom goes, um, don't go. Are you kidding? You just saw the lechuza last week. You know, you, you don't want to go to this party. And I'm like, oh, don't worry. You know, I'm going to be safe, mom. And she's like, oh, okay, well, take your, you take your cousin, John. And uh, I go, John, let's go. There's this great party. And uh, John was like, no, I'm sleepy, man. I'm, you know, I'm tired. I'm not going to go. So, of course, you know, I, I, I didn't listen to, to my mom's, you know, wisdom at that time. And I went to this party surrounded by all these crazy guys. And uh, during that time, growing up in the projects, there was a lot of gang activity. There was every night on TV, you would, you would hear about drive-by shootings, you know. And that's the media, you know, kind of focusing in on that neighborhood and, and uh, you know, really uh, focusing in on that violence, uh, gang violence uh, uh, during the uh, late 80s. So, uh, but, you know, I, I grew up in that neighborhood and I always felt safe, you know. I never was scared of walking down the street, you know. So, uh, sure enough, uh, it was Christmas Eve. Mm. It was Christmas Eve and uh, I went to this party and I was walking down the street and... Um, I saw the headlights coming towards me, and all of a sudden, you know, I saw the flash and I heard the pop, you know, and that's pretty much all you hear uh, after, you know, um, uh, something like that is, I just couldn't imagine uh, that I was shot. So I went down to the floor 
and uh, picked myself up. Frank came over and picked me up, and he goes, what's the matter? Hey, you had too much to drink. And I'm like, no, man, you know, I, uh, somebody threw me a, a cuete, a firecracker, I said. And they're like, and, and I go, I, I have to sit down. I thought it was a firecracker. It was close mm. in years. Mm. So, of course, I was wearing black. You know, I didn't see any blood until, uh, you know, I just felt all this, you know, pressure on my chest. Mm. I lifted my shirt, and there's this black hole, you know, with this giant purple bruise around it right in the center of my chest. And, and I thought that was it, you know, Frank, Frank and the guys looked down there and it was just Frank. He goes, uh, he goes, Hey man, you've been shot. You better go home, you know? <laughs> and, um, and I'm like, I go, thanks man. Take me home, you know, <laughs> get me out of here. So Frank, you know, picks me up and, uh, um, we start walking home from the Vira Mendes, you know, and, and uh, halfway down there, I, I went to the elementary school right, right in between those two projects. It was the Las Palmas Elementary, and uh, it was this huge long field. It was totally pitch black night. It was Christmas Eve. There was nobody out, and the, the, I could see the, the bright lights from the, uh, the basketball courts in the Mirasoles, you know, and there was these big bright lights. Um, all of a sudden, I saw this figure walking towards me, you know, and, and I'm like, Frank, do you see that coming this way? And he's like, he goes, there's nothing there. He's nothing there. And I, and I started freaking out. I go, mm. oh man, this is it. You know, mm. there's this dark shadow walking this way, bright lights, a tunnel, forget it. You know, I've, <laughs> I'm done for. Oh, and man. I'm like, tell my, and then I got my Chicano. I'm like, tell my mom, I'm sorry. You know, I'm ready. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was really funny. Um, but, um, Sure enough, this black, dark figure started walking towards me, and it was my cousin John. It was, it mm. was John, and, and he said, uh, he grabbed me, and he goes, he goes, I knew something was wrong. I woke up, I had a dream that mm. you were in trouble, mm. so I had to come get you. I called your mom, and she said to come get you, and, and uh, she'll be waiting for you there. So he met me halfway in between both housing projects because he had this dream. Mm. So I think I've always been fascinated with that, that um, not just superstition, but uh, that uh, almost spiritual, you know, connections that I have with uh, my family and, and friends, you know. So this drawing was a way to kind of deal with that pain and that, you know, catharsis, uh, you know, just get it I, out. I, yeah. I had to deal with it somehow, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, the drawing is uh, uh, one of my favorite drawings. Uh, this was one of the first drawings I ever sold, actually, if not the first, uh, to Joe Diaz, who's right over there i can i can't see him but i i know he's there <laughs> <laughs> and uh it's uh, graphite on paper 30 mm -hmm. by 40 inches and uh uh it traveled the nation uh for a while uh with uh, the arte caliente uh, uh joe diaz collection mm -hmm. This is another uh, um, street preacher. mixed media drawing, street preacher. So like all these, you know, true stories go on and on, but uh, this is also something that I, that some guy I met on uh, Commerce Street, right there near the San Fernando Cathedral. And uh, he was preaching at me at high speed and, and um, really, really just in my face. You know, I just had to capture him uh, with these colors, with these neon colors. I think that's what, uh, is is one of my favorite parts of the painting is that energy you know that's coming off of these neon warm colors in the in the composition. Uh, he was very angry. He was very upset. You know. So uh, I hope you know I, I captured that energy. You know. So uh, this is mixed media on paper, 1995, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, street preacher. This is a portrait of one of my neighbors in the neighborhood there in the Mirasoles, uh, Jesus, and he was only about 16, 17, he was about 16, and uh, gang member, like hardcore, and uh, he had already had uh, this young son, his little boy, and he was dressing up this little boy in gang colors, and, and um, you know, one day I was just sitting there, and he goes, hey, you're an artist, why don't you paint my portrait? So he kind of just tucks over his shirt and he has a, a gun in his pants. Mm. So that's where this piece came from. It's called Jesus y Chavalon. And uh, uh, several tattoos identify him as Jesus, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, um, you know, images of, of you know, uh, kind of funny political images uh, on, on his lapel. He has a little button called Tata, which is like kind of slang for 
daddy, you know, mm -hmm. and Titi is the bottle, you know. So I liked ha having fun with slang at that point, you know. So there's actually a lot of slang words in the other early drawings as well. And then this is a, a diptych. This is a diptych. Uh, uh, Omar uh, uh, Rodriguez owns this uh, set. And this is uh, uh, La Bacha and El Gusano. Uh, acrylic on panel. Do you want to translate for those who may not know Spanish? La bacha is cigarette butt. And that's the image on the left. What is that? Your left hand side. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, la bacha means cigarette butt. And the gusano is the worm inside a tequila bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, so at this point, you know, the style is coming, becoming a little bit more refined. Uh, the, the lines are becoming a lot more crisp and, and cleaner edge. Uh, I started working with uh, uh, an acrylic medium, uh, a fluid acrylic medium. So, you know, I think um, over the years I had kind of developed that style quite a bit. And what's the, significant of the su significance of the subject matter? You know, at that time I was still involved in that, you know, um, hanging out, going to bars, you know, uh, um, that, that uh, lifestyle, you know. So it was a series about uh, addictions or uh, mostly addictions, mm -hmm. you know, drinking and smoking and, and hanging out at bars and stuff like that, you know, so um, a lot of the work kind of reflects on those times. And then all the while you were still continuing your community work. That was, that was my day job. My community work, uh, uh, this was 1997 and I was, I had met um, all the people from the Office in Cultural Affairs, and at that point it was the Art Department of Art and Cultural Affairs, and mm -hmm. they, they, uh, I had worked with a program called CORE and Urban Smarts, where they put an artist in the classroom, in the middle school's classroom uh, after school. And uh, I was uh, artist liaison for two other artists, and I would report to uh, Bertie Vaughn and, and Ana Laura de la Garza, uh, and uh, Felix was in that office during that time. and. Uh, you know, they called me into the office and said, Alex, there's this really, uh, there's this big problem with graffiti taggers uh, on Blanco Road. And we'd like for you to go out there and, and see what you can do with these kids. And I said, no problem. Uh, went out there and I had detailed files on all these graffiti kids. You know, I went to the safe officers in that area and they knew where these guys live. They knew, you know, everything about these guys. So it was easy for me to recruit students, you know, and uh, instead of, sending them to, you know, whitewash or, or, or like paint over graffiti, I said, send them to me. You know, I can, I can uh, uh, give them an alternate material to work with. And if you're just making them paint over their graffiti work, it's just, first of all, it's giving them a blank canvas and it's, they're really, really upset about that. You know, they're pissed off, you know. So here uh, on Blanco Road, I was able to uh, work with uh, an alternate material, um, mosaic tile. You know, that was my first time working with tile, and that was in 97. And, but at this time, I wasn't actually making the tile. I was just getting donations and smashing it up and rearranging it into these panels. Uh, we did a series of four by eight panels. You see uh, on the left-hand side a couple of students uh, with a completed panel. And then there's our little workshop out on Blanco Road. You know, uh, we worked in this little covered area. It was hot, and there was mosquitoes, and there was a lot of mm. drunk guys walking by Blanco, you know. but. Uh, uh, it was fun, and it got kids off the street at least for this time, you know. And uh, uh, we sold a lot of works. I, I curated a lot of the uh, the artwork in uh, galleries, the Wong Spot, the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center, and uh, we sold a lot of work from these guys. And this is a familiar image, Borderland. This was also in the uh, the psychedelic, psychedelic exhibit mm -hmm. here. Um, another one of my crazy. Uh, research projects at Borderland off of uh, uh, Woodlawn. It's still there. It's well, no, oh, not it anymore. Closed. It was yeah. there when psychedelic yeah. was on. It was there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now it's a, it's a church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a church now. Wow. It's very strange, but uh, you know, same idea. You know, these these crazy burros hanging out, and all of a sudden somebody picks up a, a pool cue, and and it turns into this outrageous, you know, scene of of uh, people, you know, uh, transformed into this character uh, of, of uh, a burro. Well, well, the whole thing you know. was inspired, was it not, by the decor? Definitely, yeah. You know, they, 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 the burro land had little burro uh, 
ceramics and pictures and paintings all over the old bar. You know, even outside they had a burro painted outside the bar, you know. But uh, these guys turned into burros, you know, just because they were a little drunk, you know. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I think that was the fun part, you know, was just kind of uh, um, enjoying, you know, enjoying the moment and then transferring that onto canvas. <laughs> this is, uh, that was mixed media on paper, 30 mm -hmm. by 40 inches. And tell us about this project. Here we go, continuing with the, the Guadalupe. This was uh, uh, late 1999, uh, early 2000, 2001. Um, I finally landed my dream job at the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center uh, after working at the jail program for seven years. Uh, I ended that program in 1997. <coughs> and during that time in 97, I remember uh, receiving uh, the, my first Art Pace uh, grant. I uh, received the travel grant to go to London. And, uh, and, and while I was there, I just hopped over to Italy. So I was there <laughs> for about six weeks, uh, uh, four weeks in London and two weeks in Italy, you know, on the Art Pace travel grant. And uh, we stayed at uh, 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 Linda's, uh, you know, flat uh, there in Knightsbridge. It was an amazing trip for me. and, and Art Pace at that time just said, go and, you know, experience, you know, the museums and experience this, this culture. And uh, it, was, it was really, really great. So I came back from that totally energized and I finally uh, landed my dream job um, at the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center at that time, uh, working with Kathy Vargas and, and Miguel Cortinas. And uh, I, I was still actually in the, the studios from 90, 91 to, um, actually 99, 97, you know, uh, 98. So I uh, had good connections with them and um, continued to work with youth. Uh, I had a youth arts program after school. And uh, right at that time, uh, in 2000, uh, Vincent was about to graduate from uh, RISD. And uh, he gives me a call and he's like, hey, I'm ready to come back home. And I'm like, great. I said, send me all your work. Send me images of all the work that you have there on hand at RISD. And we'll get you a, a solo exhibit in the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Theater. And uh, uh, we organized that. And, we, and that was early 2000. And um, um, sold out his show. It was, we were very proud, very happy. And uh, his dad was, was there opening night. And he, was, he was just very happy that, you know, uh, Vincent was actually uh, making money off his art. You know, he had red dots everywhere, so it was, it was totally great. And we also uh, organized a, a mural program, uh, and he, uh, I contracted uh, Vincent as the lead artist for this program. As soon as he got off the plane, literally, you know, he had an exhibit, he had a, a position, he had a contract uh, with the Guadalupe, and uh, uh, we started recruiting students, and we uh, worked together. Uh, there at the Guadalupe Annex on this mural program that used to hang at the um, the Greyhound bus station. You know, it hung there for a couple of years, actually. Now, um, Alex, tell us also about UTSA and San Anto Cultural Arts that you have pictured here. UTSA, uh, San Anto came next uh, after I worked with the Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. uh, I needed to get back on the street. I needed to get back uh, on the scaffolding, so I was offered... Uh, well, actually applied, and uh, there was an, a position opening at San Anto Cultural Arts Organization, and that was 2001, uh, 2002, and three, uh, in between those years. And you'll see a, a small image, I'm sorry, I couldn't find a bigger image. That image came out at, in the uh, Lowrider magazine. Uh, this is the Sweetest Candy uh, mose uh, mural. It's on the corner of Chupaderas and Guadalupe, it's still there. And one of my lead artists at that time was Ruth Buenteo. And Ruth was a graduate of Brackenridge High School. I met her when she was in high school and uh, worked with me. Uh, I was the, became the mural coordinator for uh, San Anto Cultural Arts. And I remember telling her, I'm like, Ruth, you know, one of these days, you know, you're gonna come back, uh, you know, armed with a degree and you're gonna take my position, you know? I'm gonna be ready to move on, you know, and continue my work. So I need you well-trained and with that degree, ready to take over these, these, uh, this challenge, this, this position. And sure enough, Ruth uh, applied for a scholarship at the uh, Art Institute in Chicago. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. And uh, she had a lot of mural designs, mural portfolio uh, designs, and she received uh, 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 some uh, financial assistance and went to um, Chicago. Mm -hmm. Came back uh, four years later, and uh, now she's currently the mural coordinator at San Anto Cultural Arts. And there you, I, go. you know, I I I I love that whole set of seri uh, series of photographs here because it's almost torch. it's yeah it's yeah. that cycle mm -hmm. I always talk about this cycle mm -hmm. you know of